You know, we have a guy here in the studio that I just love, and he fell down, he hurt his ankle, and you can see that thing every day just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You and I call that swelling. How it became known as inflammation, I have no idea, but doctors call it inflammation because there are anti-inflammatory drugs, right? Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Then we're gonna talk about something called valley fever. You live in California, Nevada, the desert areas. You need to learn about this. Then I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite books. Then I get to introduce you to Dr. Ken Hunter and Frank Jordan and Mark Campbell, all talking about this product beta glucan. We're going to talk about that for five, ten minutes today. And then Kyle and I are going to sit down and go over some of the Facebook questions we get on our live show. All that and more on Know the Cause. This show is brought to you by the NSC Company. When you can't, beta glue can. My name is Doug Kaufman. For the past 40 years, I've dedicated my life and even my career to finding the root cause of disease. Join me and a team of physicians, pharmacists, and scientists. And soon you too will know the cause. You know, it was probably 15 years ago, Time Magazine ran the cover and it was a joint, it was a skeleton and a joint that was all lit up red and it said, inflammation. Uh, finally, the cause of disease is discovered and it's inflammation. And I'm sitting there looking at that. Do they really think, and it said Parkinson's or Alzheimer's and cancer and other diseases are caused by inflammation. Folks, the danger in American medicine is looking at the effect and believing it's the cause. Oh, your elbow's really swollen. You know, you have inflammation. That's not the cause. What caused the inflammation? Well, we don't know that. We'll just, we have anti-inflammatory drugs. So I'm gonna put this together in layman's terms and make it easy for you to understand so we can sidestep a lot of the big words that come up when you're in, ouch, when you're in pain. Pain in layman's terms, inflammation, they use that big word. To you and me, swelling. Pro-inflammatory, makes you swollen. Anti-inflammatory, thought to be drugs, but it's so much more than drugs. C-reactive protein, okay? It's a blood test that can measure swelling inside your body. Be careful of this, folks, because systemic fungal infections can elevate your C-reactive protein. You guys go to the doctor and, you know, you're hurting, oh, my hip, I can't get out of bed, and the next morning it's my other hip, and then my neck, and yada, yada, yada. Stop the swelling going on in your body. But it, you want a Band-Aid? Go to the doctor. He'll draw blood. I don't know what it costs. I haven't been to one, but it's got to be over 100 bucks, and he'll do a C-reactive protein on you. And he'll, yep, sure enough, Mrs. Jones, you have swelling. What are we going to do about that, doc? Oh, I can put you on a drug. How long do I need? Well, let's go down this road. C-reactive protein, a blood test, science. Swelling is your enemy. Doug Kaufman, swelling is your friend. Your job is to figure out the cause of ouch, okay? See, you guys find yourself running from doctor to doctor. You'll go to a naturopath, I think that's a great idea. A chiropractor, I think that's a great idea. A physician, look, these people learn how to reach into their right pocket, put a ballpoint pen in their left hand, and scribble something that only a pharmacist can interpret, okay? So, let's go down here. Inflammation is your enemy. Ouch, take this drug. What does it do? It's an anti-inflammatory. Side effects? Yes. Talk to the pharmacist. How long do I need this drug? For life. How do I get it? Keep making appointments with me because I've got to draw your blood. Why? To make sure your kidney and liver aren't being destroyed by it. How much does it cost? You have insurance. You know where I'm going with this, folks. You absolutely know where I'm going with this. <coughs> Excuse me. We are running from doctor to doctor and we're trying, you remember the drug Vioxx? What a nightmare. How many of your lives were ruined by this drug and 30 other drugs that were FDA approved and now they're gone? Wonder how many of the new ones you see on TV now? Do you love the way you see a drug ad? And there's the beautiful music and the kids playing on the pond with a man who can't inhale because he has COPD, but now he takes this drug and now he can inhale. After that ad comes a law firm. If you've taken this drug and it's caused you misery or cancer or something to fall off your body, 
call us right now. Toll free number, we'll see you for free. What is happening in America? The simple fact is those ads are working. And you just saw a little office visit, okay? Doug Kaufman, however, says, inflammation is your friend. Try and dig through this with me. I went to the free dictionary and got this. What is swelling? It's called inflammation. Protective tissue response to injury or destruction of tissues, which serves to destroy, dilute, or wall off the injurious agent and the injured tissue. Injurious agent? You mean there's a cause? Think about that. When you fall down and hit your elbow and, man, it swells up, most of us, you know, go to the doctor. And if it's a bad enough fall, I might, too. Um, But I'm going to, you know, put something on there. But that swelling is necessary. Just let it happen. That swelling blocks off more damage done deeper, okay? Swelling is not your enemy. It causes pain. And I think many of you can manage your pain. Injurious agent? You mean there's a cause? Okay. Common fungal poisons in our body as injurious agents. Look at this out of the Journal of Immunology. Certain mycotoxins activate inflammatory responses. They can make you swell. Common fungal poisons in our body, the injurious agents. Human white blood cells from normal subjects produce uh, pro-inflammatory responses. They swell when exposed to this fungus. Your white blood cells become pro-inflammatories around yeast. And finally, bloodstream fungal infections elevate C-reactive protein blood tests that determine swelling. So what's the take-home message? I think most of you watching this right now who are in pain need to change your diet. You don't get it, folks. I didn't get it 45 years ago either. But we've had physicians on this show that say, you know, 60, 80% of my patients didn't need antifungals. They needed to change their diet. What does the Kaufman One diet do? It starves fungus that can induce inflammation and raise the C-reactive protein, okay? Be careful out there. What if a diet and a little exercise could fix your pain in the next 30 days? Would you do it? Will you do it? You know, those of you who have been watching Know the Cause for an extended period of time, gosh, it's been on 16, 17 years now, um, know that my history goes back way beyond that. I came home from Vietnam and I was sick and all the king's horses, all the king's men, all the king's drugs couldn't put me back together again. But I thought that cortisone was a miracle drug because it stopped the bleeding in the folds of my arm. I had uh, come into a bad fungus in Vietnam and I brought it home with me. Many of us did. And I brought it home with me, and I couldn't get it fixed. I realized that my diet, which at that time I was 21, of beer and cookies and sandwiches was the wrong diet because it was feeding uh, all of these problems going on inside my body. I remember reading, gosh, this is probably 10 years into my career when I began to think fungus really is a problem. I remember reading about guys in the military, in the Air Force in California, who were getting serious diseases of the lung, and some of them dying. And they defined this disease, they named it valley fever, because it was in the California valleys. And fever was one of the symptoms, but why were these people dying? And then you began to study it, right? These were guys working on jets, and the jets would take off in the sand. (laughs) Off it would go, stir up the sand, and they'd inhale it, right? Could there be something in the sand? Could this fungus live in the sand? Welcome to valley fever, or coccidio ideomycosis is what the disease is called. If you've traveled through endemic areas, that this soil fungus, sand fungus, and the wind blows, and you got the car windows down, you don't have the airplane windows open, but it's amazing how many pollutants enter that airplane or enter that train, even though the windows are up, and you're now sick. Think valley fever. Just think it. Because all of us, 100% of us, go to a doctor with these symptoms, and the doctor, God bless him, folks, he doesn't know what to do. Looks like he got a flu. Give you an antibiotic, okay? Here's what e-medicine says. Interest in coccidioideomycosis, big way of saying exposure to that fungus and then it causing a disease, has been renewed because of massive migration to the Sun Belt states. Areas that were once nothing, few homes in them, like Phoenix, where I was born. Uh, Dad tells me that, you know, 100 years ago when I was born, it was a tiny city. But look, Phoenix and Tucson, Arizona, 
Bakersfield and Fresno, California, El Paso, Texas, they're prime examples. These used to be tiny cities and now they're huge cities and people are moving into them. And when you build a home, you stir up the dust. And so builders and plumbers and, and people who travel or live in these areas uh, often have problems that start with this valley fever just kind of minimally, okay? If you've traveled to endemic areas and a cough or breathing problems began, if you've been prescribed medications like antibiotics but your health problems actually have worsened, if you've seen several doctors for the problem, then you might ask your doc for an ESR, it's a red blood cell sedimentation rate, an erythrocyte sed rate, a blood test. The doctor may find a fairly normal CBC, the complete blood count, but an elevated ESR which may prompt further testing for coccidio species of fungus. Now, doctors know this, folks. Doctors absolutely know that they can do an erythro, uh, erythrocyte sed rate. And if that tends to be elevated, but your white count looks normal, everything else looks kind of good, this could be a fungus. Then the problem begins. I wish it were just that simple, take a tube of blood and check for coccidio. One day it will be. Now we got to go in and kind of take cultures and wait a week to get them back. Fungus testing is difficult, but it's a godsend for people who have had, maybe been misdiagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung disease, or asthma, or a chronic cough, or you know any of these lung or respiratory diseases. It can be a godsend. Maybe the doctor could try a couple of Diflucan, 200 milligrams a day for a couple of days, and you're gonna switch to the Kaufman diet, which starves coccidio and other fungi, right? So try that for a week and see if your cough doesn't get much, much better. Please report it back to the doctor because if he's in Arizona or California, he sees this all the time. And an educated doctor is gonna help a whole lot of patients. I sometimes reflect on times in my life around which some books are written that I love. Fungus books just are, for me, everything. 1972, I was home from Vietnam. Uh, one year I was home, I was working with Howard Gottschalk, an ear, nose, and throat doctor in Los Angeles, and Dr. Elizabeth Moore Landacker wrote this book, Fundamentals of the Fungi, 1972. Couple of, this book, we talked to Dr. Landacker when we were writing, Dr. Beverly Hunt, Dr. Dave Holland, and I were writing the book on cancer. Uh, sweet, sweet woman. Here's a couple of things she says. Fungi almost invariably alter the pH of mediums in which they grow. You and I are fungal mediums. So if we're a good acidic uh, pH, it can alter your pH down to acid. And then it goes on to say that it also, uh, it says a common cause of decrease in pH or more acidity is the accumulation of organic acids uh, uh, which are formed from the metabolism of sugars. So understand when we eat sugar, we become more acid. How do we eat sugars? Grains convert when we chew them up. Grains convert during the digestive process to glucose. That's a sugar. So grains and sugars are things we want to be careful of. The book was a wealth of information, just a wealth of information. Now, it's fairly technical. She's a PhD, a very, very bright woman. And so the book is chapters and chapters. It's got to be about, yeah, 500 pages. But if you can get a copy of this, folks, I encourage you, if you're on my team here and you really understand, gosh, my life has been saved by what Doug's talking about, start a library. Old books like these are only going to do one thing in value. It's like good real estate or antique cars. Going to go up, up, up in value. You can probably get this book secondhand. I found one for Kyle, and I think he paid $40 for it. It's an invaluable resource for those of you who really want to understand why the phase one diet is making you feel so much better. Hey friends, do me a favor. So many people are undergoing chemotherapy and radiation today, millions and millions of you. If only we would acknowledge the word chemoprotective. What could protect us against chemotherapy and radiation? Dr. Ken Hunter, Mark Campbell, and Frank Jordan join me today from the NSC company, these two are, and from the University of Nevada School of Medicine, Dr. Ken Hunter. Chemoprotection, what does that mean, Dr. Hunter? Well, the inevitability with cancer today is that uh, chemotherapy and radiation are still mainline therapies. 
There are some new biological therapies that are coming along, but let's face it, uh, we have a long way to go before we can abandon chemotherapy and radiation. And of course, it damages uh, our own tissues when we do it. And so people are just very, very miserable. Um, many, many years ago, at the Armed Forces Radiobiological Research Institute in Washington, D.C., uh, research was done that basically showed how beta-glucan stimulating these wonderful cells called macrophages was actually radioprotective. That is, um, it, it would help the, the body repair from being insulted by, in this case, gamma radiation. And of course, the same thing would be the case for chemotherapy. And, and unfortunately, that, uh, that never really grabbed on uh, in the modern era where we know how beta-glucan stimulates macrophages and that macrophages are absolutely critical for, um, for removing dead and dying tissue and starting the healing process, which is absolutely essential for people to... Uh, to heal after these uh, these insults that have mm -hmm. to occur, um, I think that beta glucan for that purpose uh, is something that needs uh, a lot more attention than it's getting today. And coming from someone who has researched this molecule for twenty years, that's a big piece of the puzzle if you're going through this type of therapy. Frank, you've been able to monitor. You have a lot of people who have contacted you from my show and other shows Many. Um, that um, have taken beta-glucan with some pretty good responses. We've been very pleased. Now, that's anecdotal. It's not a double-blind sure. plant right. study, but there is no question that probably we have more people that use our glucan due to taking radiation and chemo mm -hmm and trying to modify or negate some of those negative side effects that just uh, do come. We might state too, there's also a lot of research that says that the glucan will help your body to go back into the bone marrow and recreate new red blood cells, uh, platelets, and some white blood cells. Those that are damaged or killed by the chemo and radiation. As Dr. Hunter says, you have collateral Damage. It's like throwing a hand grenade into a crowded room. You hope you get the terrorist, but unfortunately you're going to get some innocent people with it. Well, that's what happens in your body. This helps to replenish those that have a critical function in the body. Uh, the energy, the red blood cells deliver oxygen. That converts to energy. I'm just, just one example, mm -hmm. but it goes on and on. So it's very, very important. The glucan, it chemo, is. and radiation should always be in a combination. Even if you're taking another drug, take it too. Mark, how has Dr. Hunter's involvement been made any substantial difference in your company? I know it has. It's been incredible. Not only has he steered the, the application of beta-glucan, but also the direction by which we can find ways to improve it and, and addressing its shortcomings as, as, a, as a particle in, a, in its natural state. And through him, we have not only continued the evolution of beta-glucan because it's, it's been a back and forth uh, uh, rapport that we've had. And, and, and the closest that we, that we hold with the university and, and Ken's lab has only advanced the product beyond what anybody else could do. I understand you guys just signed another two-year deal with the medical school and, and Dr. Hunter's lab. What will happen in two years? I mean, these are huge revelations that you've discovered over the past couple of decades with this beta-glucan. What do you see in two years unfolding? Well, in, in two years, we're, we're focusing on the mucosal immune system. This is a product that's given orally, and we've discovered um, many of the basic biological mechanisms whereby beta-glucan is effectuating a change in that mucosal immune system. We're going to continue those studies. And we hope to begin to do some studies in, uh, in humans. Yes. It's very difficult to study the mucosal immune system, but we're going to do our first human studies during this next segment. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for your time coming all the way out. If you'd like to try beta-glucans, it's yours free. If you haven't uh, gotten this envelope before, there are 10 of the NSC100s, the big boys in here. Try it for 10 days. Watch the beta-glucan difference. Thank you all very much.
Okay, now it's time with Kyle Drew to go back to Facebook, some of the questions that you had, and these were actually uh, a few weeks ago, so bear with us, folks. We'll try and get as many of these as we can on TV. Uh, Diane asks, autoimmune disorders and their relation to fungus. Oh, wow. Yeah. How many are there, Kyle? Oh, are there, uh, what's it up to 85, now? Uh, I thought that it was over 100 at this point, but yeah, it just keeps growing. Yeah. And uh, this is the, the whole idea of autoimmune is that the body, for some reason, begins attacking itself. And you talk to any doctor, you talk to all of these patients, and they can recite for you, word for word, everything that tells them that the, the body is fighting itself. And this is bizarre. I remember having a conversation with an immunologist years ago um, from St. Jude's mm -hmm. in Memphis. And he and I were having a discussion out by a pool one day, and I said, is there anything in immunology whereby the body tries to kill itself or attack and injure itself? And he thought about that, and he said, no, there isn't. Hmm. any reason hmm. why, the, and he knew what I was going at. Yeah, I, I was trying to him. set him up, yeah. and he knew, and he said, this is, it's always attacking something. There is a target. I think that autoimmune disease is the body attacking something. Let's say it's your joints. There's something in your joints. Uh, are they mycotoxins? Are they fungi themselves? What is it? But the body, under no circumstances, according to this immunologist, ever attacks or attempts to injure itself. And Kyle, then we talk about some of the manifestations that we see in most autoimmune diseases. A high um, CRP, or not CRP, yeah, C-reactive protein. C -reactive yeah, protein. C-reactive protein. That means it's a lot of inflammation in these people. Yeah. What causes inflammation? Fungus is known, systemic fungus is known to increase these. So we have cancer, diabetes, yeah. and a litany of other uh, diseases that are autoimmune diseases. Something invisible to the naked eye is causing those cells to put boxing gloves on. It is not two cells fighting each other, although both may be damaged or killed in the presence of mycotoxins. And so many times when people get on a phase one mm -hmm. diet, take the antifungal approach for the very first time, symptoms begin to diminish. You got it. That you is a it. good little test you can run. Okay, hope that helps, Diane. Now getting on to the next one, epilepsy, period. Mm, yeah, period. <laughs> we, we could have just <laughs> talked about that. My seven-year-old has been suffering, oh man, oh, for geez. the last four years. She's been on four different medications, nothing works. She's also on allergy shots, almost lost her to hearing, uh, lost her hearing at one point from epilepsy meds. Long story short, I woke up after watching you on TV. Now I give her milk thistle, uh. antifungal oil of oregano, antifungal olive leaf supplements, antifungal probiotics, antifungal. Thing is because of the inflammation, which we know is fungus, she has not had a seizure in nine days. Wow, yes. you're on to something there. Thank you, love your show, faithful to you guys forever. Wow. Jana, uh, thank you once again. I can't diagnose nor prognose any medical condition. You did. Hmm. Listen, I've been told this forever. Cancer is cancer, Doug, it's not fungus. And yet if you treat it as though it's a fungal infection, Sporinox, the toenail fungus medication, has been published four separate times as killing cancer cells. So if you go on Sporinox, you have a tumor in your breast. You go on Sporinox, you change your diet, you juice, you sit in a far infrared sauna, you begin exercising and sweating, and this lump clears up. Was that cancer? Mm. Or if it responded favorably to an antifungal regimen, was it fungus? Are we grossly overdiagnosing disease in America today, and is that profitable? You with me on that? I am. I'm with you on that. And when I see what she's giving uh, this little seven-year-old, nine-year-old, yeah. oh, no seizures in nine days. When I see that, I'm just so thrilled because you've got the liver working. You've got things happening yeah, with the way you're killing. Yeah. That's right. And the thing that I love about this is that so many parents are trying things. They're trying things. They're so tired of their child coming home with the side effects from medications, and maybe they give them a little coconut oil, mm -hmm. some good fats to nourish mm -hmm. the brain, to help the nerves for something like this. I love it when I see it, but when it's a child, it breaks my heart whenever I see a problem like this, but when I see a mom taking charge, don't yep. mess with a mama. Yep. When a mom takes charge, you see results like this. Yeah. Do you think it's coincidental that hundreds of you have told me 
I was worried about my niece, my daughter, my grandma, etc. And I happened on to your show. Not going to be. Thanks, guys. Thanks. There it is, folks. There's a lineup. We were talking with Dr. Ken Hunter and Frank and Mark about today. This is the guy I take every day. This is 10 milligram. This one is the three milligram, and there is their powerful caprylic acid. Of course, as we mentioned on all these shows, this is yours free. There's a dozen uh, beta-glucan in here if you'd like to try it. Even the shipping is free. Folks, I have to pause for a moment and thank you for your willingness to learn. There's an old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I'm here Monday through Friday. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.